all these people in this in this service um, have gone to stand and worship the Lord with us. Dearly Father, Lord, we want to come to you this morning. Thank you so much for the honor and privilege of being here this morning. I ask and pray, Lord, first of all, that you would gather each and every one of us. We thank you so much for the warmth of this service. We just thank you for the Father right behind the sound school. We pray and ask that you would apply that to our lives here. But Father, at this time, we come to uh, bring some need to front of you. I ask and pray, Lord, that you meet every single need that we have, that you would work out all the situations that we mentioned to us, and that we would try to be faithful, Lord, to give you the honor and glory for whatever is done. I pray and ask that we would all be obedient to you today, and that anything that needs to be said today in the service that would be, Father, we thank you and love you and that you would lead us. I ask you to lead us today. So be with us, lead and guide us. We pray in the precious name of Savior Jesus. All right. Birthdays and anniversaries. Birthdays. Anniversaries. Let's all stand and sing happy birthday to Miss Tish.
Let's do 148. We know 148. What number you got? 148. 148. Good song. That's a really good song. That's a good pick. Thank you. 
two people on the same page. Yeah. Yeah, way over there. Yeah. Not successful. Anyway, the team's going to sing one, and then when Steve gets done, I want Chris to come and sing one. So the Lord gives Chris one, but the team has to sing one next. And so Lucky will get next to sing <coughs> Looking forward to heaven is nigh. Amen. And we're all invited to the wedding. Instead of It's on my mind and on my heart um, because of this story of youth, which is amazing. It's going to be amazing in heaven. There were ninety and nine that safely lay in the shelter of the But one was sad on the king's 
but the shepherd made answer, this of mine has wandered away from me. And although the road be rough and steep, I go to the desert to find my sheep. I go to the desert to find my sheep. But all To the gate of hell, rejoice, I found my sheep. And the angels echo around the throne, rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. Take your Bibles and turn this morning to Ephesians chapter 3. Brother Lucky, as you were sitting there talking about coming to church and how exciting it is, I want you to know that Ephesians chapter 3 is a chapter that was meant just for you and me. And in fact, it's meant for all of us that are here this morning because in Ephesians chapter 3, we see that the gospel is actually opened up to the Gentile nation. Prior to this time, it, it's been taught and it's been preached and it's been taught that, that Jesus was given to the nation Israel and that's been the message that's been going forth from the disciples and from the church. And then we get to Ephesians and we look at chapter 3 and all of a sudden we see that the writer sits there and says, I have been made a minister unto the Gentiles that they might know that they too can claim the inheritance of God. Now I want you to think about that for a moment and think about what a life-changing moment chapter 3 is. Prior to chapter 3, really and truly, we were a, a foreign nation to, to, the, to the idea of the gospel. We, we were distant to that. But in chapter 3, all of a sudden now, Brother Johnny, we become grafted in. We become a part of the chosen. We become a part of those folks that, that can actually tap into the gospel message. And so as the writer begins to write, he says, I want you to know that today I am a minister unto the Gentile nation to say that even they might be grafted in to, the, uh, to eternal life through salvation. Now, I say that to say this. We're getting ready to read a passage of scripture here, and it's, it actually concludes chapter 3, that I had been taught all my life was a passage of scripture that I was as a Christian to lay claim to, to lay, lay a promise to, that, that God's going to do more than I could ever, ever, ever imagine in my life. And while that is certainly true, I'm going to challenge you, I, I, just, just right now, right where you're at, imagine something. Imagine something. Brother Johnny, imagine that you're a millionaire today. Imagine that. Did God let you become a millionaire? But yet, as I was growing up, I was told, because I could imagine it, God could make it so. And don't get me wrong, God has the power to do it, but did he make you a millionaire? You imagined it, did he make you a millionaire? No. And where I'm going with that is this. Sometimes when we read scripture, we make the, the fallacy of saying, it's all about me. And in fact, what we're getting ready to read is that it's not about me, it's about Him. All the glory goes to Him. All the things that are done on this earth are done for His purpose and for His glory. Everything that we do is a, is a gift from God that we might shine on Him and give Him glory. I, 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 I will say this, the other night Harrison was pitching and, and it closed out the season pretty much for, for the JV team and, 
he was pitching and he was doing a good job and, and they came up and it got to the, to the point where it was getting down to the last few innings and Harrison got up to hit and, and man, I'm just sitting there and I, I, lucky, I don't know if you've ever had this happen to you, but there, you know, where you just get so excited, you almost get lightheaded. This moment happened to me. Harrison gets up, he's getting ready to hit and lo and behold, this guy grooves one right down the middle and he hits it. I mean, I'm sitting there, I jump straight up, I'm yelling, I'm screaming, and all of a sudden I'm thinking, whoa, I'm getting a little lightheaded here. Whoa, I better sit back down. So I'm sitting down as everybody else is standing up and cheering, and I'm trying to see sort of through people where the ball lands and where the ball hits uh, out in the outfield, and all of a sudden I hear this, fuck. Now, to you, that doesn't mean a lot. But to me, that meant a whole lot. Because what that meant, Brother Lucky, was that ball had sailed so far that it actually hit almost one foot below going out of the park, but it hit on that metal fence, and it made this huge thunk. I'm so excited, I'm so stoked, that even lightheaded, I'd jump back up and start yelling again, right? I was looking down, and Harrison's rounding first base, and there is a guy on first base about the size of Kevin. And Harrison hits this guy about the size of Kevin, and... That kid didn't move, just like you could sort of think Kevin probably wouldn't move, right? That kid didn't move at all. Harrison tumbled, fumbled, rolled, did all, everything. I mean, he was just a mess out there. And I'm like, get up, son, get up. So he finally makes it. He runs to second base and he stops. And I'm sitting there looking at him. I'm wondering, what's he thinking in his mind? Is, is he all right? Is he hurt? Anything wrong? Did, did this kid just like almost kill him? What happened? And Harrison looks back and he does this. Mom, and it ticked me off. Kevin, it ticked me off because Dara hasn't spent one moment outside teaching Harrison how to hit a baseball. Not one moment did she spend all last summer throwing baseballs at this kid to teach him how to hit. Not one moment has she done any of those things that got him prepared. But who is it that he yells out to? Mom, right? I sat there and I thought, man, that little kid. I'm going to pinch his little head off when he gets over here. So finally, game ends, and he comes over, and I, I congratulate him on a great game of pitching. And then I said, what would you think of that hit? He goes, Dad, I said, I almost got it out of here. I almost knocked that ball completely out of the, uh, out of the field of play. I almost hit that home run, and I've been longing for that and been looking at that. And, man, I almost got there. And, Dad, I appreciate you helping me last year. Now, I'm just going to pause right here for just a moment and ask you as a parent or ask you as a person who, who maybe is married or ask you as a person who maybe is involved in any type of service or any type of, why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? Every one of us in this room, somewhere along the way, makes sacrifices for certain things. Last summer, I spent a lot of time making sacrifices, going out in the middle of the heat, trying to teach Harrison how to hit a baseball and I got to see him hit that ball and then I got to hear him say thank you all right thank you made it worth all those times that I was out there sweating and just thinking man this kid if, if I don't get him to swing right I'm going to lose my mind right all those things culminated into that moment of him just saying thank you now I want to take you to your Christian walk to your Christian life, and to your faith. Why is it that you do the things you do for God? Why do you do them? And I say that because sometimes we have the wrong motives and the wrong priorities on why we do the things that we do for God. And so we'll sit there and we'll say, all right, this is all about me. God, I want you to shower me with stuff. I want you to shower me with blessings. I want you to shower me with good things. I, I, I want my life to be easy. I want my life to be good. And, and so we do those things thinking that if I do my part, God's going to do his part and make my life great. Going back to the imagination. But you know what we miss when we talk about thinking about what God can do, we forget why God is doing, why God is doing what God is doing, right? What is it that God's doing through you and why is he doing it through you? As we're getting ready to read here in just a moment, it's not so that I have good stuff. It's not so that I have an easy life. It's not so that I can be recognized or praised but rather everything that God does through me is done for the purpose of building the kingdom 
of God. It's about reaching lost people. It's about taking care of, of business here so that people might be able to come to Christ and ask for forgiveness and be saved on the back end. And with that being said, I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn and stand to Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading with verse 13. By the way, just to let you know, at this particular point, Paul is in prison. Paul is in prison, and this is what he has to say. And I want you to not forget that. Paul is in prison. He's getting ready to say in just a moment those things that you can imagine God's able to do, but that's not what's going on in Paul's life. Paul is in prison. And let's read what he says. It says, verse 13, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. Now, I saw nowhere in there that they would have an easy life. That is not his prayer. I see nowhere in there that they might be recognized and praised or that they might be lifted up. You don't see that in his prayer, but rather that we might have might be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And to know the love of Christ with patch, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Brother Johnny, would you lead us in prayer? And amen, and you may be seated. This morning, I could get up here and I could preach a sermon and I could tell you that God loves you, that God cares for you, that God will provide for you, and that God will do this and God will do that. And I could be telling you, the, and I would be telling you the truth, but it's not this passage of Scripture that would tell you that. That's not what this passage of Scripture gets us to focus our attention on. Don't get me wrong. God wants things to happen in your life that are good. God wants you to be able to enjoy life abundantly. God's there to bless you and to keep you and to take care of you. But this passage of Scripture is not meant to give you that type of encouragement. This passage of Scripture is to encourage you in a different way, and that is to say this. Everything that we do, even our suffering even the pain that we go through in life, even those struggles that we deal with, just as Paul is in prison at this moment, everything that we face, everything that we do is done for his glory that we might build the church. Glory to him in the church. World without end. Amen. See, this morning, as we came to this place, I hope we came with the understanding that we were coming into this place of worship to praise Him, to worship Him, and to lift Him up and give Him glory. Notice I didn't say anything about the preacher. Notice I didn't say anything about uh, the music leader. Notice I didn't say anything about the deacons, Sunday school, or anything else. Notice I didn't say anything about our wonderful solos who sang. And, and Karen, I appreciate you singing. Brother Steve, I appreciate you singing this morning. But none of that... Is, is meant for us to have glory. Everything that we do this morning is what? That he might get glory from us. And that's the message this morning that I want to share with you, and that is this. We must find comfort and joy, not just in the good things that God does for us, but in the fact that he has chosen to use us to build the kingdom. God could have very easily have said, Johnny, when you accept Jesus Christ in your life, I'm just taking you out of here, taking you straight to heaven. Your time on earth is done. I'm just leaving here long enough for you to get saved. And instead of using you to reach lost people, I'll use the angels to do it. And I'll have the angels go around. And I'll have the angels try and preach and teach and do all that. But Johnny, once you get saved, I'm just going to take you right out of earth. And I'm going to take you and place you right in heaven and you're, you're done. 
He could have done that, but that's not his plan. Why is it not his plan? Because part of, uh, of all of the joy that we have is also in the ministry to which we're called. And if you go back and you continue to read chapter 3 on at the beginning, you'll find that Paul is so excited about this fact that he has been called to be the minister to the Gentiles, to literally share a message that says they too can accept Christ. And here he is in a jail cell. Here he is writing a letter out of jail to others to simply say this, it is about God, it is about His glory, it is about all His power and all that He can do and the fact that He could have done any number of things but in fact He has chosen to use Paul from a jail cell to reach lost people. What about for you? Are you that type of Christian? Are you that seasoned in your life as a Christian that when things go wrong rather than getting upset or rather than getting mad or rather than, than sitting there asking God questions about why this is going wrong or that's going wrong, do you take time to literally say, God, thank you because I know somewhere in the midst of this you're going to use me to minister? Are, are you that person that sits there and says, you know what, God, I don't know why I'm dealing with this, but you would have never have let this happen if there wasn't a plan. God, you would have never have allowed these things into my life if you didn't have something for me to do through it that you might be lifted up and glorified. God, thank you for what you've allowed to happen in my life. I've shared with you all about my uncle and about some of the things that he's going through. And, and I got the opportunity to sit down and talk with him. And one of the things that he really has just sort of brought to, to my attention is this. No matter how dim things might look, there truly is a silver lining. There truly is. No matter how dim it may look, there is truly a silver lining. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes it's hard to see, isn't it? Sometimes it's hard to see how, how going through a situation that may be in your life where, where God has given you a silver lining in the midst of it. But it is important for us to take pause and to take thought and to ask us this question. If God is able to do all things, and He is, if God does love me beyond all measure, and He does, or He would have never have sent His Son Jesus to die on a cross, and if you put those two things together, what that tells me is if I'm going through something that is uncomfortable, something that, uh, that actually has just caused me to pause, something that uh, I just don't like in my life, something that, that I would even uh, term as, as detrimental to my life, if I'm sitting there and I'm going through this, don't I also have to acknowledge the fact that if God could, because He's got the power, and God loves beyond all measure, if I put those two things together, whatever I'm facing has to be for my benefit. Now pause for a moment. You're saying, Tim, that if I come down with cancer tomorrow, that is for my benefit? And my answer to you is yes. You're like, what? The answer is yes. Well, how is that so, Tim? How can that be so? Well, I'm going to take you back to my uncle. I asked him the same question. Uh, do you not get discouraged? Are you not frustrated? Do you sometimes question God? And his answer to me was this. Tim, we're all going to die. At some point in time, every person on this earth is going to leave this earth to stand before God in judgment. At some point in time, we've all got to find a way out of here, and we've all got to find a way to the throne of God to be judged. And that's going to happen. Now, the other side of that is, Tim, I'm just going to pause and ask you this question. What is there here on this earth outside of family that you're holding on to so much for? Now think about that for a moment. What is there on this planet that gives you such an excitement that you're holding on so much that you can't let go if it's not family, right? Or what are you holding on to if it's not the fact that God's using you? What are you holding on to if it's not the fact that God's not blessing you? What is it that you're holding on to if it's not all these things that are of God and not of yourself? And he began to tell me very frankly, Tim, he said, while there are so much goodness and, and fond, uh, fond thoughts and memories of, of me here on this earth doing certain things, to sit here and say that this world is a place of paradise is a lie. And we tell ourselves that when we get close to dying. Oh, this is, I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave this world. I don't want to move on. But if you're a Christian, what are you moving on to?
For him, he says that cancer is a blessing because it's a means to an end to leave this world to then be in God's presence. For others, maybe not so. Maybe it's frustrating. Maybe it's uh, disappointing. I know for my aunt, she absolutely is hating the thought of my uncle dying. No doubt about it. But yet, for him, he's taking the approach that, wait a minute, I've got to get there at some point in time, and I'm leaving this world, which is not paradise, to inherit the kingdom of God, which is paradise. And in the midst of that, by the way, I get to also be there in the presence of God. So in his mind, he sees it as a blessing. Now, I'm going to just turn this for just a moment, and, and I'll, I promise I'll be quick with it. Back some years ago, I asked a person if dying, if that person dying, if it led somebody to Jesus and getting saved, are, are they excited about their own death? And the statement they said was, yes, if, if me dying led somebody else to Jesus, I'm all about it. And I began to read scripture. And I began to study this idea of if me dying means somebody else would receive Christ, then, then I'm okay. And do you know what I've come to discover? All the disciples, with the exception of Judas Iscariot, took that philosophy. All the disciples took that philosophy. If it means me dying, that God be elevated and lifted up, then it's worth me dying because it means people are coming to know Christ. Now that's a faith, right? This morning, as we've come to this place, and as we've read this passage of Scripture, I hope that in your heart and in your mind right now, you're asking yourself this question. God, would, am I that type of person that would be willing to lay down my life so that you might get glory and that others might be saved? Or Father, if I'm not in that place, would you help me to get to that place? And here's why. Just as Paul was in prison and yet he found peace, just as Paul, though he be in prison, was able to find the joy of, of the ministry and joy of God's grace, just as Paul, even in, in prison, saw things to be excited about and even told others not to be discouraged because he was in prison, but rather that they might, uh, rather than worry about his tribulation, be excited about what God was doing. If we're not in that place, then we're missing the joys that God already has for us. You're saying, well, Tim, I don't want to be in a place of tribulation. And my answer to you is this. You're probably already there. You're getting ready to be. There's three kinds of people, and we've gone over this before. There's those people, those people that are having problems, those people that are in their problem, or those people that are getting ready to go into a problem. And we know that's the reality of life. And right now, wherever you're at in your walk with Christ, you're either coming out of a situation that was bad, you're in a situation that's bad, or you're going to go into a situation that's bad. And the way that we deal with those things will determine the joy that we have in spite of the tribulations that we face. Now this morning, as you've gathered here, I hope that you came with this expectation that God loves you more than you could ever imagine. That God has the power to do more than you could ever imagine. And that if I'm willing to submit myself this morning, God is able to use me, though it may be through tribulation or though it may be on the mountaintop, God is able to use me to minister to others if I'll just get my focus right and I just let God choose to use in me anything that he sees fit so that, there, uh, so that through us as a church, God might receive the glory to himself through us. If you're here this morning and you're lost, I want to share a great piece of uh, news with you, and that is this. God brought you here for a purpose. You may not have realized that when you got up this morning, but if you're here this morning and you're lost, God had a plan in place, and it's already being performed even now that you might hear the message that says that Jesus loves you so much that he came and he died for you. And he came that you might ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and save you. And so this morning, as we're here during this service, God has already opened the door. God has already uh, unleashed all of his angels into this place to begin to even share and to minister to your heart, to literally start convicting you to say, you need to make sure that before you leave this place today, you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and save you. This morning, 
As we come to a time of close, I'm going to ask that in just a moment when Brother David begins to sing, that you step out and you come and you say, Tim, would you just share with me, how can I be saved today? How can I ask Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins and save me? As a Christian, oh, how important it is that we be a people of faith that claim the promise that he's given us that whether we're going through tribulation or whether we're on the mountaintop, all the things that he's doing are for his glory that others might come to know him. Would you stand with me this morning with heads bowed and with eyes closed as Brother David makes his way back down front? With heads bowed and with eyes closed, whatever God's telling you to do this morning, oh, how I pray that you'll be obedient to him that you'll do whatever it is that he's laid on your heart, that you'll be faithful to do those things that he's, he's presented to you this morning, that you might be faithful in obedience to him this morning. Father, I pray that you might just take this invitation. Use it, Father, in any way that you see fit. God, take my life and use it in any way that you would have me to live and, and the things that I must face so that you might receive glory. Father, that you might be lifted up and that lost people might come to know you. Bless us now as only you can, for it's in your name we pray. And with heads bowed and with eyes closed, as Brother David sings, would you come? I'm so glad you're here this morning. Don't forget, Buildings and Grounds Committee, if you'll meet me down here on the front to my left, you're right, then we'll be very quick with that meeting. Brother Tony, would you dismiss us with a word of prayer today?